Today's episode of Uncorking Story is brought to you by Slippery People by Mike Carlin. Slippery People is inspired by a talking head song and is the fourth novel in the acclaimed Farragram series. You can purchase Slippery People in paperback or Kindle format from Amazon.com. Enjoy the show. Welcome to A Corking A Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm excited to share with you my interview with author and facial coding expert Dan Hill. Now, if you don't know what facial coding is, I won't leave you in suspense any longer. It's the process of measuring human emotions through facial expressions and is often used in market research, adding another layer of insight when evaluating communications and experiences. Now, usually the authors I get to interview on this program are people with whom I don't really have much in common with other than the fact that we're both writers. Yes, it does mean that we tend to share some kind of innate curiosity with the world, and, and maybe it's true that we see the world a little bit differently than the average person. But Dan and I actually do have something bigger in common. We both have spent a large portion of our professional lives working in the market research profession. Dan in the area of facial coding and myself as a qualitative moderator. Since you're going to hear more about Dan in a moment, I did want to spend a few minutes talking about something that this interview sparked in me, and that's this notion that, you know, we as human beings aren't always good at communicating what we feel. I mean, have you ever struggled to find the right words to phrase your reaction to something that you've been challenged with? Sometimes we get tripped up and sometimes we actually say things that we don't mean, or, you know, our brains try and process something and... You know, that whole thing that happens in that black box between our ears kind of muddles uh, muddles up with our intentions a little bit. Now, in things I've read, you know, guys, men, uh, we have a harder time doing this than women. I don't mean to overgeneralize. It's just things that I've read. Uh, recently, I overheard my wife talking to her daughter who was complaining about her boyfriend's inability to express himself to her verbally. And my wife said something like, you know, 18-year-old guys just aren't good at that, Maggie. And I was thinking to myself, well, 45-year-old guys aren't much better. Now, in focus groups, I often catch people contradicting themselves. And this is kind of part of that same dynamic. You know, for example, in one part of a discussion, someone might rate a concept that we're testing very highly, but then have next to nothing positive to say about it. Now, were they lying about their rating? Were they lying about their reactions? No, I, I don't think that's true, but it's likely that subconsciously, they filter their response for any number of reasons. You know, some people don't want to seem too harsh. They want to be viewed as polite. Or, you know, maybe they actually like the brand but not the idea that the brand was bringing them, and they weighted the brand more highly than the idea when they were giving their, raise, uh, their reason. But whatever the reason, it, it happens um, frequently in a well-trained interview, such as myself. Uh, that's just a humble brag. Uh, can politely ask people to clarify their point of view when their inconsistency is spotted. So back to facial coding and what Dan Hill does. You know, that's a tool that's a really cool addition to a researcher's toolbox because it can detect confusion, agreement, happiness, sadness, name the emotion, uh, you know, fill in the blanks here without having to travel from the participants' brains to their lips. So it's kind of another layer of information and data we could use when, when we're kind of assessing an idea and people's reactions to it. It's actually pretty cool. Now, I wish I could actually have a facial code, a coding tool available uh, whenever an agent reads one of my query letters so I'd actually have some information other than the standard form letter response to know uh, what they really think of a book idea, uh, which reminds me, Slippery People is available uh, for purchase in paperback and ebook format from Amazon.com. It is the fourth novel in uh, the Farragram series. People love the Farragram series. I'm very happy with it, especially Uncorking Murder, the first book. Uh, you know, four years later, it still sells very well. And um, I'm very happy with the way uh, Slippery People turned out. It, it is getting some good reviews. Uh, but of course, my kids' college fund would appreciate it if you and a million of your friends would go to Amazon.com, purchase it, or download it. Was that a bit too self serving? Yes. It absolutely was. As I'm hearing myself actually say that, it is self-serving. But that's something I've actually been working on with my therapist, which is doing a better job at promoting my accomplishments. So I'll blame that little bit of a shameless self-promotion on following doctor's orders. Okay, see how I did that? Uh, all right, enough from me. 
Here is my interview with eight-time author and facial coding expert, Dan Hill. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about you, Dan. So, I mean, we, we've kind of worked in the same industry. I mean, different, slightly different sides of it. Um, but what I was really curious about was just studying your background. You have a, a PhD in English. Um, so I'm curious how you wound up in the market research industry and, and specifically involved in, um, in doing some neat stuff like facial coding. Well, um, you know, after the PhD, I, and I did have some tenure track offers, but the idea of circling comma splices for 19 year olds until I died for not a lot of money just didn't seem terribly exciting. And my wife had a good job. Uh, so I said, stick with your job and I'll find something else. So I actually was originally in consumer affairs as the only non lawyer ever hired into a job of writing regulations and meeting with uh, advisory boards and various professions. And then I jumped to corporate life. Uh, almost by chance because someone, you know, there was a change in administration and somebody was uh, um, trying to find a new job. He was a political appointee. I was not. And uh, he got turned down for a job, which was very smart because he was not a good writer. And the job involved speech writing for the CEO of a major company. So he said, well, you want to try it? So almost on a lark, I, I said, sure, I'll, I'll interview if they'll let me. And I got hired and uh, we did focus groups because we were thinking about changing the company's name. And I was the co-chair of the branding task force. And that was my first exposure to market research, to basically the business world, even though my dad was a 3M executive. And I uh, just kind of kept the whole thing in the back of my head. And then a few years later, I ended up trying to ghostwrite a book for a president of a company that was a pioneer in, in uh, customer experience, a guy named Lou Carbone. And Lou knew a guy at IBM who changed my life because one day he sent over an article from a now deceased Cornell University university publication talking about the breakthroughs in brain science and how much we're intuitive emotional decision makers and my, my hands were trembling when i finished reading the article i just said this is so cool i have no idea whether i can make a living doing this stuff but this is you know this is just profoundly interesting and square with my instincts as to how human beings operate and um you know, we were supposedly at the at the consulting firm doing research, but we really weren't. The, the CEO had a very big ego, and uh, he would gather just enough snippets to cover his derriere as to where he wanted to go, and not much more than that. And so, you know, when I read the article, I went, oh, this is really cool. I'm not sure I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do this somehow. And at first I said, oh, I could stay here and try to plug it in for Lou. And I said, well, first of all, he'll never appreciate it. And second, he's not going to fund it. <laughs> So why bother? So I, I decided, you know, within a day or two to go start my own company. But it took me a long time to figure out the right tool set because, you know, uh, most tools are cognitively filtered. So it, it took a long time. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I fell into this industry. I was a psychology student and I was, you know, all set to, to go on after my undergraduate to get my PhD. But Somebody suggested that I get a job before I do that. <laughs> and, um, you know, just to see what the working world was like, it was probably my dad. It was like, you know, you've been in school for a while. The PhD, you know, in, in clinical psych was going to be at least seven to eight years between coursework and dissertation and all the, the, the practicum. So I said, okay. So I wound up at, a, at, at working in advertising um, at a traditional Madison Avenue firm. And I saw my first focus group and I said, that's, that's what I want to do with my life. You know, it, cause it, to me, it reminded me of doing group therapy. Um, and, but instead of talking to people, a group of people about their problems, we were talking about you know, how we could make the Citibank website better. This was back in 96 or 97 and forget it. I, I, I got hooked on, on the, the market research business then and there. And, and I've been, Sort of, I don't want to say in love with it because it, you know, it, it's certainly frustrating at times. But um, yeah, it was it was not my intention to to get involved in the field. But you know, I I stayed in it and I I liked it. But um, I'm curious about the um, the facial coding because I was involved back in, gosh, it's probably the mid 2000s. There was a company called Oh God, I can't remember it now. Um, Interscope, Interscope Research, um, sure. a guy named Dr. Carl Marcy. And yeah. they they weren't doing facial coding, but they were doing a lot of biometric type stuff. Um, yeah. And that was fast, you know, trying to get to the underlying emotions of an emotional reaction to some kind of stimuli. But uh, 
Yeah, no, I, I know Carl pretty well because I was on the, the ARF's original neuromarketing task force. And Carl's toolkit was essentially getting arousal data yeah. through a variety of measures. But he really couldn't get to emotions because from those tools, the differentiation is either, is either slight or none. And I was much more interested. I mean, arousal matters. But, you know, as I've said to people in interviews, you know, I can have an intense reaction to Hitler. I don't plan to buy from him. Right. Um, so that that is important. It's very important, but it, it is by no means enough. Um, and without a divining rod to know whether that intense reaction, that engagement is positive or negative. And then there's just so much diagnostic richness in being able to go to specific emotions. Right. And that's what really interested me. And as they correctly said in the task force, all the academics who were brought in to be the adjudicators, there's only two tools that can do that. And the other one is fMRI brain scans, but they're hideously expensive, invasive as can be. You can't get to a large subset. And if you're doing advertising, you can't get to the split second. You got a time delay of, you know, roughly five to eight seconds. Right. And, you know, a lot happens in three seconds, you know, span. So uh, in a TV spot that's been edited at all decently, so, um, you know, to me, it was obvious and it, you know, my mom was an interior designer. I was, I was an art history minor in college. Facial coding was just like, oh yeah, this, this is a, a fit once I found it, but it took me more than half a year to find it. I had put together a toolkit, kind of my own amalgamation of a variety of things. And uh, a good friend of mine who had been in ad agencies uh, said, uh, remind me again why you were so excited by that Cornell art article. So like a man feeling like I was walking the plank, I started to explain it to him. And then I just cut it off. And I said, Joe, you just got to tell me what's the problem here. What am I doing wrong? He said, well, it's really simple. And I kind of like gripped the edge of my, my desk that evening as he told me. I said, oh, so what is the problem? He said, you're asking people to think their feelings. And guess what? They, they feel their feelings. Right. And um, so I, I got off the call. I was shattered. I had spent half a year putting this all together. Went for a walk along the beach in uh, San Diego where I was living, where I started my company. And I don't know, somewhere probably about 1030 at night, I said, it's the body. It's the only thing that's left. But I didn't choose to go to the body in the way that Carl did because um, I, I came across facial coding. Yeah. And um, that was, you know, my version of your love story, you know, with focus groups. I, I came across the tool and I just thought, this, this is it, you know. It, you know, it's fascinating because I was I was just doing a project this past week and, you know, our client was, um, a, you know, big uh, mobile uh, uh, wireless services provider. And they really wanted to get, you know, to the emotional attributes in their category. And she's like, well, you know, you got to uncover how they feel, how they feel. And I'm like, yeah, I, I can try and do that with words <laughs> as much as I can by asking them and pushing and laddering and even using projective techniques, but it's uh, it's it's not the easiest thing in the world to describe feelings because people's vocabulary, the average person, is very limited. Um, yes. So 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 to walk me through like this epiphany you had with facial coding and you know from from the early days and and then how you started to um, kind of monetize that or commercialize it into a service offering. Um, well, it started with, um, you know, coming across that Charles Darwin was the first scientist to take emotions seriously and that he came to realize that even a person born blind emotes the same way as you or I, that the underlying physiology was the same. And, you know, knowing, having lived, you know, both in England and Italy, you know, earlier in my life and, uh, you know, travels and so forth, I knew I needed a tool that had that kind of, you know, range to it. Um, you know, so then the question was, well, Darwin's not around for a conversation, so uh, who, who might be? And that's when I discovered Paul Ekman, uh, who was really the expert on facial coding. The problem there was that Paul hated business. You know, he just had a real academic scorn for business. And he wouldn't take a meeting. Um, but I had become friends already with a psychologist named Andrew Ortoni at Northwestern University who did me immense favor, favor and just called up and, and, and him and, and Ekman were actually kind of intellectual rivals, but he called up Paul and just said, take the damn meeting. Dan's a nice guy. He's got a PhD. He's not your typical business type whatsoever. Just take the meeting. So, um, you know, Paul gave me, uh, you know, his big 500 page manual, which wasn't terribly helpful. And I came back to him and said, what else do you have? 
and I paid him some money, not a lot. It's probably the best investment I ever made in life. Um, so I didn't buy Apple stock on the third day of the company. And, um, you know, then I, he didn't have scoring system. He didn't have norms. He didn't have a protocol, you know, outside of, uh, you know, doing it in his lab. So, you know, there was a lot of things I had to refine. And so the first four years I used biofeedback as well, because then I could couple, kind of double track. And there was the only graduate program in the country in biofeedback happened to be in San Diego, my good luck. And the director of that particular part of the program uh, happened to have been at the Mayo Clinic previously. So he knew Minnesota. And um, that's actually what got me in because at first he ignored my phone calls also. And uh, then one time in leaving a message, I just mentioned something about Minnesota and boom, he calls. <laughs> so it's always worthwhile to know what people's roots are. Right. You know. um, so yeah, I just had to work it up by degrees. Um, you know, you know, you just, you had to refine the scoring system. I went through several permutations, um, you know, before I could find what was going to work for me. So, you know, it's, you know, I never left behind what Paul fundamentally did, but I had to adapt it. I had to refine it. I had to develop it further in some ways. Uh, and you know, uh, I, I've probably done more facial coding than Paul, quite honestly, because, you know, he, he does his, his uh, patience and, is little experiments, but you know, I've done it week in, week out for 20 plus years. Yeah. I was going to say, what, what year are we talking about here? What, what, what the uh, early 98 days? 98 was okay. when I started my company. All right. So you, you've got, so a lot of things are happening then you've got, um, you know, the internet really starting to, to take off as a consumer medium. Um, yep. so I'm, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes. I mean, back in those days I had moved from traditional advertising to digital and, um, you know, we were trying to convince clients to start doing their market research online. So moving from telephone, random digit dial studies um, to, you know, online surveys. And at that point in time, that it was almost like too much for many of our clients to handle. I mean, if you think most market research people, uh, not to over overgeneralize, Dan, but some of them aren't the most progressive in the world in terms of their thinking. So I'm trying to put myself in your shoes thinking, how am I even trying to sell something like facial coding that no one's probably even heard of at that point in time? Uh, it was very difficult. Um, I, you know, all the meetings were in, in person, first of all. Um, I, I had to make them believe, which was true, that I, you know, that I was credible, that I had done my homework. Uh, that the tool was sound, that I wasn't going to screw them over. I mean, I was certainly helped by the fact my father had been in charge of 3M printed post-it notes, production, sales, and marketing. So before I started the company, I just said, let's, let's sit down and I'm going to just get out a notepad and you tell me all the things you don't like about your market research providers at 3M. And it was a pretty long list. My dad <laughs> has pretty high standards. Uh, and I said, okay, well, I'm going to try not to, to, to do those things. And he said, what's the most, I said to him, what's the most important thing to avoid? He said, don't perjure yourself. You know, most important thing is hold on to your believability. And um, so it was, it was a very hard sell. I mean, I had to get the people who were innovative, who were either bored with the status quo or felt like they'd learned everything they could from the existing toolkit, uh, had a huge problem had a huge opportunity or just really intellectually curious and confident enough to challenge the internal system at a client and say, we're going to do this a different way. I also told them that it was not an either or proposition. I said, we're happy to do the ratings, the verbatims, the traditional interview questions. Uh, you can use your existing provider, you know, and we will pony along. I said, you know, we're, we, we just think that, you know, there's system one and system two. And, uh, you know, you're not going to get system one any other way than this, which was very much true at that time. And uh, we can bring that piece into the puzzle for you. But we're not trying to disconnect or tell you to ignore system two. We're just going to complement the fact that human nature being what it is, you'll get a much more reliable read from going both directions. And then, you know, certainly I was helped by, you know, more and more scientific literature coming out about, you know, subconscious and emotions and so forth. So each little dribble help. But when you say that uh, so much of the, re of the profession is not progressive, oh my God, that's so true. <laughs> I, I was actually shocked. I, I assumed they were going to be the in-house intellectuals. 
And I, I, you know, original pitch meetings, I'd come in and I'd, I'd mention this book or article that I've been reading and I'd get these blank looks, you know, way too often. So uh, I just started moving to the practicality right. of it. <laughs> right. So what was that first sale like when, when somebody first said, yeah, we'll move forward with this? Like what, you know, what, what, what was the key to your success there? And what was that, what was that experience like for you? Uh, uh, that was actually a project for Target. And, um, what happened is I, I, I had a meeting with them. I, I thought, well, who, who knows? My, my father, by the way, had said, uh, you know, you'll, you'll probably have to be a bottom feeder. He didn't, he didn't think this was going to make any sense. He said, do, do competitive research. You know, they, they always know they can't get a unbiased opinion inside the building. He said, so why, why don't you dig in and do that instead? And I said, that's, that's fine. I understand that. That's not really what's motivating me. And I, you know, I was home visiting my parents and I had a meeting at, at uh, Dayton Hudson because that's really what the company still was in many ways. That's the origin of Target, the department stores. Uh, we, you know, our former uh, governor is Mark Dayton and he had the money to run because <laughs> he was part of that fortune. So um, to my surprise one day, uh, they call me up and they say, we'll do something with you. And I said, well, what's the assignment? And <laughs> it's nothing small. It's, are they going to sell off Dayton Hudson because they decide there is or isn't a future for it with the next generation of shoppers? And I said, well, that's, that's cool. That's a great assignment. You know, I'm trying not to tell them it's my first job ever, uh, you know, doing this. And then I said, what's the time frame? And they said, uh, can you do it in 72 hours? And I said, um, okay, because, <laughs> you know, no was not going to be the right answer. And um, so I came in and we just grabbed people uh, pretty much off the floor and had a, a separate you know, room we could use in, in the department store in Minneapolis downtown. And we just went after, I guess that was Generation Y at the time. And we got, what, 40 people? and tape them, use the biofeedback. I flew in someone who's a biofeedback expert from Seattle uh, who basically took all the money from the project because she was expensive. <laughs> um, and we put in two 20-hour plus days, you know, crunching the data and doing all the work. It was much more a project around biofeedback. The facial coding was pretty much supplementary. And, uh, but, you know, I did the whole interview. It was, it was also the ratings and the questions and everything else. And, uh, you know, she went to bed and I, I went up to back up to Twin Cities from my parents' house and presented, you know, to a group. And I, I told them, you know, my opinion is move on. I, I said, I see no emotional affinity. This is where their aunt buys them, you know, a birthday gift. Mm -hmm. um, I said, I, I think your future is entirely target. And uh, I, I'd sell the department store. I said, that's what my data suggests. And, and they did that. And I'm sure there's no way we were the only data point in such a monumental decision. Uh, but the, the funny thing is many years later, I ended up having a meeting at Macy's in New York and they were, you know, still buying up other department store chains. And I said, I, I gotta be honest with you. You know, I, I, I'm not sure I'd be doing that. I, I think I'd be investigating how you're going to change your model and come up with some smaller formats and more boutiques. And I said, you know, I know you have little boutique footprints within the big stores, but, you know, based on our research, cause you know, Target had us investigate that. That wasn't enough to make a difference emotionally. Um, so, but you know, they didn't listen to me. All right. No, no. And the, you know, a, a lot of those, you know, traditional department stores are hurting now. Um, you know, even in this goes on before COVID-19 um, just Amazon and, you know, your, your online providers are taking a big chunk and, and I don't think they did a great job moving to e-commerce either. Um, no. And the other problem there is, you know, this is where inequality comes back in the middle class, you know, has shrunk and, you know, the economy is bifurcated with the 10% the doing really well. And, you know, the 1% doing fabulous. <laughs> And then you've got, you know, the other 90% and, you know, 20, 30% of them might be holding ground somewhat, but shrinking, relatively speaking, versus, you know, rate of inflation. And then the, the lower part, you know, is, you know, underwater. Yeah. So their, their market disappeared on them in some ways. 
I'm curious about, so, I mean, there's customer experience, retail experience, certainly. What about, you know, online user experience and where do you, um, you know, where does Century Logic come into play with, with regards to that? Are you using facial coding while, while people are kind of going through, you know, for example, going through a website, um, you know, is that, is that an application that, that, uh, Oh yeah, no, absolutely. We, we've done it. Yeah. The first thing was, was easy was landing pages. Um, but no, then we moved on into experiential mode and, you know, emotions unfold over time. It's a good fit. Uh, it's just a question of how, you know, they're, they're giving us, you know, revised site. They got a dummy site that's limited the number of pages, you know, what can, you know, the rabbits can scurry lots of places. Right. And, you know, with facial coding, you can get, you get data every second potentially. So, that, you know, you can make it a very complicated <laughs> report and process. And so we, we tend to tell them we, we love some wandering time. That's fine. But we also suggest you have a few defined tasks. Yeah. And you throw in the landing page and, you know, and, and then we're, we're trying to understand that where they're coming from, what they think they need. Uh, usually we like to put in a competitive set when possible. If nothing else, it's either it's at least maybe two different versions of a new website. It's their old versus the one they're, they're trying out, um, you know, but, we try for some sort of context, uh, but there's other times where we're just asked to plunge deep, you know, give them 20 minutes, let them go where they're going to go. Um, you know, and then maybe there's one task in there, which might be even a fairly long task, but um, no, no, it, it definitely fits. It's just, it's messy. So you got to try to have a good conversation up front and hope your clients thought it through a bit mm. as you well know. And we, we do use eye tracking with it um, on a fair number of those kinds of projects. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Is, can you can you do it after the fact? I mean, does it have to be set up um, to 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 be a facial coding study, or can can you you know work with video footage? Let's say you know picture in picture video footage. Is is that uh, oh feasible? sure? No, that's certainly happened where we just get the footage afterwards. Um, you know, it, studies a little bit inconclusive. They want to go deeper. Um, you know, I remember one project for a package of goods company. It wasn't actually that, but they said, so we took all this videotape from these interviews. We didn't draw a whole lot of conclusions, but we spent the money. We think there's something there. And there actually was, there was a really cool emotional segmentation scheme. It proved to be one of my all time favorite projects, but basically they said, yeah, we got these assets sitting around. We do have video, so we could facially code it. And would you? And, and I said, yeah, we could. Um, so no, no, we, you know, we just need to either get observational opportunities, you know, where we go and actually in the back room for a focus group, or I've actually co-moderated focus groups where I'm not really the moderator so much as I am taking my codes down <laughs> and maybe popping in a few questions based on what I see, some follow-ups. Yeah. Uh, so we, we've done that and we do streamed video. We've got video that gets sent to us. I mean, it's gotten a lot easier. You know, you asked about the early days, my God, we would take a camera and, and you know, attach it to the end of the table and drop in the cassette and, uh, and hope you didn't forget that the cassette needed to be flipped, yeah. you know, after the first half hour, hour. So, you know, life has certainly gotten easier. It's funny. I just found a box of old cassette tapes in my, uh, in my basement from, uh, from the nineties, just those old, you know, Memorex, uh, Memorex yeah. cassettes. And, uh, it's, it's funny. It's like, I, I want to purge them and get rid of them, but I also, you know, they're also mementos from what feels like a bygone era right now. It, it is. Same thing with, you know, I, I never really bought any that were before my time, but A-track tapes for music. You know, oh, yeah. They're so big and chunky. I mean, it's just, it's remarkable. But then I remember my dad getting his first uh, cell phone because he started commuting from the, the college town I grew up in called Northfield, Minnesota, up to St. Paul. And so they gave him a people were at least in minnesota people were not commuting like that at the time it just my sister and i put our foot down and said we're sick of moving we've got good friends and my dad was nice enough to agree <laughs> so three of them gave him a game one of the first cell phones and god it was a brick oh sure sure yeah and then it had this whole console they actually like had to like come by like build it into his car right between the two front seats it was I was, I was like, really? No, I remember my father had one of those too. He worked for American Express in, in sales. And uh, I remember in, in his company car, when, when they had such things, he had the big brick right in between the, the you know, the driver's and passenger seat. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. 
Um, you know, I, 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 see, I see, by the way, you got a guitar in the background. I take it you're a musician. Well, musician might be a stretch, Dan, but uh, I, I do attempt to play it from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got uh, – my acoustic is over there and electric's there. Got a couple of others just kind of around. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's something I noodle on uh, in, between, uh, in between interviews when, uh, when I need to keep my mind going. But uh, I don't want to think too much, so. And, and anyway, I interrupted you. you no, no, no. I was, I was, I was going to say, you know, as a as a PhD in English, uh, I'm sure the the writing, you know, part of your your career, kind of going, um, not just as a research practitioner, but as an author, um, seems like a natural fit. Um, when did you when did you publish your first book, and and what what prompted you to um, to start writing that first book? Well, you know, I, I had written a novel in high school, one in college, um, you know, a dissertation. So, you know, it wasn't a stretch to imagine I was going to try a business book. Um, it turned out very strangely. So I, um, I reached out to Jeff Herman and he took me on because he said, this is cool. This is the next thing. And um, I ended up getting a woman at John Wiley who had a series and I was in the same series as the CMO of Coca-Cola. Um, so that was pretty cool seemingly, but it wasn't really in the end because she was just about to have her first child and she decided she was also sick of John Wiley. And so she left, which meant my mentor disappeared on me. And, um, you know, so I, I had an assistant who was a very nice person, but no power within the company. Yeah. So they released the book in late August, didn't tell me. Uh, didn't offer any marketing support, uh, changed. I, I had laid out the book beautifully with all sorts of visuals. I, you know, I'm a visually oriented guy, art history minor. Uh, I had a graphic designer on my staff. We laid out the whole book for them. We had called out quotes. We had a visual, pretty much every other page. They took it all out. They took out 98% of the visuals, all the, all the call out quotes, uh, redid my prose. I was like, I've been cited in best American essays three times. You're, you're rewriting my prose. <laughs> Uh, a friend of mine said, oh, yeah, Dan, they must have gotten tired. They said, in Chapter 7, I think your voice starts to filter in just a little bit. <laughs> um, it, it was a miserable experience. Um, and then they also, the, before the woman left uh, to have her first child, or, yeah, I think it was her first child, she, um, I think, called me or emailed me out of the blue one day and said, oh, we, we got a contract for you. I mean, we've just been talking. She's, she said, um, so, you know, you need to turn the book in at the end of October. This was like September 10th. I, I had written part of a first chapter, really sloppy, and an intro, which I'd shown her. And the intro wasn't long enough to be a real proper intro. That's all I had. Yeah. And I had work, you know, I, 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 you know, I had, you know, employment work, you know, I had projects to do. Seven weeks. I was like, I can't do seven weeks. And then she said, well, how about Thanksgiving? And I like just killed myself. I would put in the work for the day. And then I would pour myself a rum and Coke and start writing for the next five hours and then get up and do two hours in the morning before I started my work day, seven days a week, I mean, yeah. just, you know, wall to wall. That's and I got to November and, and uh, I said, I just, I, I can't, I can't quite make it. I said, give me two more weeks. And the reason was, which I couldn't tell her was I'd given a earlier draft to two or three friends, none of whom thought it was good enough. <laughs> So I had to, you know, re-dig in and make it better. But, you know, I was just working like a madman. So I wasn't too surprised that they weren't overwhelmed with it. Um, and, and then I got, I turned it into her at Christmas time, as it turned out. Because then she said, oh, if we're in mid-December, just give it to me Christmas. And then she came back right after Christmas and said, I need one more chapter. I was like, I am exhausted. <laughs> um, so I, I just wrote a really crappy one more chapter for her. <laughs> And which, what, what, what was that book? What was the name of that book? It was called Body of Truth. Um, okay. It was one of their better covers. I mean, John Wiley does not have great covers. I went into the building for the meeting and I looked at all the covers and all the books that are up along the wall and I went, God, those are ugly covers. <laughs> and um, they came up with at least above average for them. Right. So, right. Yeah. Um, so that's the first one. What, out of curiosity, whatever happened to the novel you wrote, uh, you said when you were in high school or college or? Uh, one of each. Um, I, I would say there should be a law against high school students writing a novel. <laughs> that's probably, that'd probably be a good law. 
<laughs> that would yeah, get bipartisan but, support, probably. Yeah, I think so. The the one in college was only slightly better. I, I'm not a novelist. I'm I'm a nonfiction guy. I yep. I wrote poetry for a long time. Uh, my MA from Brown was you know I was a poet at the time. I, I was a better essayist than a poet. Fit me better. But I'm a better essayist than I'm a full book writer. I mean, I just, I like writing in short forms. Right. You know, you know, was a poet. So uh, I can do a full length book, but I, I like it in little chunks or breaking it up, you know, uh, just works better for me. Novelist, I'm definitely not. Yeah, I, um, I, 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 I've been writing novels um, and I just, I just had my seventh out back oh, in wow. March Okay, but now I now I've got this itch that I want to scratch, which is I do want to do something nonfiction wise, um, and I had this this creative idea. Um, well, I, I've got the title. <laughs> I've got the title. The title is um, "We Need to Talk," and it, the thing is, like, whenever you hear those words, like nothing good comes after those words, right? If somebody comes up to you and says, "We need to talk," like, and and you know, I'm thinking to myself, "Gosh, you know." When my sister says those words to me, it means like she needs money. And if my mother says those words to me, it means, you know, there's something wrong with my dad. And if my wife says those words to me, it means that I'm in very big trouble. <laughs> but yeah, no, no, I, I agree. I, I've actually used almost the exact same <laughs> phrasing. You know, when, when, I, when a woman says that to her husband, he emotionally floods. Yeah. Because, you know, emotions are always an away game for guys. Right. Right. Because, you know, I mean, women talk about emotions. Guys generally don't. I mean, I do have male friends who will, but I also have male friends who I can only play sports with. Right. You know, or maybe I can discuss an album, but I can't get personal about it. I can right. just say, isn't that a cool song? Well, I, uh, <laughs> I came up with this little defense mechanism. So if my wife ever calls me and says, we need to talk, I know that it's going to be bad. So I try and head it off by saying something like, honey, I'm just leaving the jewelry store now. <laughs> <laughs> and then usually <laughs> maybe sometimes it's a, I don't want to call it a get out of jail free card, but at least it builds a little bit of hope and goodwill. Um, but my thing was, you know, since I talk for a living, um, you know, running consumer interviews, I, I wanted to, to do like a, a newer, like more modern version of a, um, a book on qualitative research because most of the books out there on qualitative research are, uh, they're a little bit dry, Dan. Um, they're just a bit dry. That might be putting it kindly. Yeah. Um, so any anything, any writing projects you're working on now? Well, I wrote three books in the last two years. Okay. So, um, no, I, I actually do not intend to write another book. I, I've written, you know, eight that are published. And, you know, if you throw in the dissertation, uh, a book that I wrote on American festivals at the end of graduate school, Um you know, the two novels. So, you know, I'm up to about a, a baker's dozen. So right. I, I think that's, in my case, that's enough. I did not know you were a novelist, though. That's cool. Yeah, well, I started this podcast as, um, actually, I started as a way to showcase my interviewing skills because my clients would always, you know, prospective clients would always say, hey, we'd, we'd like to see a tape of your work. And I'd always say, well, I can't share that with you because it's it's client work. Um, you know, if, if you're Unilever, I, I, and, and you're trying to hire me, I can't give you, you know, the work I've done for Pepsi. It's just not, there's nothing ethical about it. Um, so I said, you know what, maybe I'll, I'll start a, a interview based podcast to, um, uh, showcase my interviewing skills so I can just point people to, to the interviews. And since I have been writing novels, um, one of my publicists that I've worked with said, Hey, you should interview other authors, because then it's kind of a built-in way you could cross-promote your work and their work. And I said, you know, that's that's not a terrible idea. So then he started, you know, getting me in with these big publishing houses. And I started interviewing, you know, somewhat A-list authors. And uh, it, it kind of created a little niche audience for me and, you know, gives my clients or prospective clients a little something, a little taste of my interviewing style to see if, if sure. we'd be a good and fit or a, not. As a writer, there's a chance to talk to other writers. Yeah. 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 So one story going back to you asked how tough it was to get started. So um, I um, so I was in Texas and I got a meeting with this with Frito Lay and I was very surprised because I wasn't trying for the senior vice president of market research. You know, I was happy with the general manager, whoever it was. 
but I got elevated to that person. I thought, okay, that's, that's odd, but I guess they're maybe the intellectually curious one and uh, wanted to take the meeting. And um, so I get there and I, I'm forced to wait for a while. Um, which I thought was a bit rude because it wasn't like five minutes. It was, you know, almost half an hour. And I get in and he says, so tell me what you're up to and why. And I start to explain. And uh, he cuts me off and he starts screaming at me. (laughs) And essentially it is, you know, I'm a market researcher. I've won these awards. I've done this. I've, you know, our sales have gone here. You know, how dare you suggest that my data is flawed? And uh, I was very taken back. And, um, you know, I said, well, you know, here's the science. Here's why I think, you know, getting another stream of data can make sense. I, I'm not here to tell you your data is wrong. I'm telling you there's other data that could be interesting and valuable to your company. And he just kept pushing me like the whole idea was fraudulent. And finally, just by chance, I blurted out, well, you know, I, I come from North Dakota by background. So we're not a lot of blue bloods there, not a lot of frauds. The, you know, the, the climate's much too harsh. You know, if, you, if you're going to be a fraud, you're going to probably go someplace else to make your living. And he goes, oh, you're from North Dakota. Well, it turned out he was from North Dakota. <laughs> and, and I thought for a moment that was going to change the whole dynamics of the meeting, but it ultimately didn't. <laughs> uh, he just softened for, you know, three, three minutes or something. Right. But that, that I mean, he, he was livid. I mean, there, there was white spittle like on the corners of his mouth. Yeah. He was that mad. Yeah. Amazing what how people behave when they feel a little bit threatened. Um, yeah. So that, that one certainly sticks in my memory. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, and it sounds like you were involved in the Advertising Research Foundation as well. Um, it was, were those, was that in the Jim Spath years or um, – was that after Jim Spath? I can't remember. I'm trying to. I think it might have been. I mean, the, the the whole thing culminated with the task force. There was a lot of very peculiar aspects to it. But so then they were going to have us speak at the ARF, but they yep. put us late afternoon on a lower floor. And they let some people on the task force who were kind of the least progressive people yeah. get, you know, prime time things where they kind of debunked the whole test. Right. Right. And, you know, and, and I, I yeah, I, I got a chance for some offline conversations. And I think really what it came down to is, you know, their, their due, dues paying members were traditional and they were by far the bulk of the revenue. Yeah. And so they knew they had to kind of pry the door open, but they weren't going to blow the hinges off. No. And no. so they, they really kind of deep sixed us. And it, it was it was interesting, but ugly. <laughs> yeah, I remember speaking at the ARF. Gosh, it was in 2000. And I had just published a paper there, I was working for a company called Dynamic Logic at the time, um, and we were we were uh, known for startup, but, but tracking the branding effectiveness of online advertising. So we, we would run these, um, you know, test control experiments with people exposed to online advertising, and, and do some attitudinal survey questions after exposure, just to prove that there's a branding value to online advertising. And I remember getting up. I was all of 25, six, seven years old. I can't remember at the time, but getting up, you know, in front of these ARF members, you know, at, at this week of workshops and just, you know, you'd think I was telling them that the sky was, was, you know, green, (laughs) you know, it's just, it's just, it it was a funny, it was a really funny experience in the sense that some people are just so close minded to doing things differently and, and there, there being a different possibility, um, but I guess it goes back to this notion of market research people not being the most progressively minded people in the world. Yeah, they often weren't, and um, you know, I mean, I found the 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 intrepid souls, and fortunately, there was enough of them. Um, so I made my way forward. But I also remember there was another meeting. This one was with Safeway, and uh, her subordinate, I could tell, was like all over it. He he would have hired me in a moment. But, you know, being a facial coder, I could tell from her expressions, let alone her words, that this was not going to happen. So at the end of the meeting, she says to me, so in other words, Dan, if you're right, because you really didn't take my point that I wasn't trying to invalidate her data. I was trying to supplement it. She didn't, she, that just, she was too threatened to manage to take in that all important nuance. And she said, in other words, Dan, if you're right, everything in my files is wrong. That binary. 
Yeah, and and that was not what I was saying, but because I I knew this was not happening, I I I changed my usual pattern. I I came back and said, "Well, there's a chance of that." And you know, and then, of course that she loved that, but um she said, "Well, this is" and then she just said at the end she said, "Well, this is really out of the box. You know that, Dan. Really out of the box." And I said, I said, "I'm not trained as a market researcher." I said, um, you know, I don't even know where the box is when I started my company. Right. And that wasn't quite true because I, you know, observed or helped facilitate the focus groups that my utility company in New Jersey ran. Um, you know, and we had a little bit of research, very little at the uh, consulting firm, but it was it was close to the truth. Yep. Yep. So as we as we wrap up here, what's one thing, that is, let's say, um, back, you know, thinking into the future, when when we have in person face to face meetings again, um, w- what are some principles uh, of facial coding you could um, you could educate us on to to tell whether or not let's say we're in a sales situation somebody somebody's you know really into what we're what we're talking about what's what's what are some pointers that you know those of us who have to sell for a living because um, I have to do that too uh, can can look to to say hey this this prospective client is uh they're you know i don't want to say on 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 the hook because i hate that term but uh you know that they're likely to give us a yes um well lack of engagement you know where there's no muscle activity that signals and emotions would be an immediate problem because they've checked out they decide this isn't going to happen um and the meeting was over whether they told you that or not um, I guess beyond that, sure, there's always a smile, which is to embrace, to hug, to uh, accept. Um, so, you know, if you don't get any smiles, that's probably a, a bad sign. But some people try to play it really close to the vest. So I think the more important and reliable thing to actually go to is the negative emotions, um, of which the most vital is if they smirk, that's contempt. And John Gottman, who runs the Love Lab at the University of Washington, Seattle, or at least used to, uh, you know, has used facial coding in marriage counseling. And that's the most reliable indicator that a marriage will fail is contempt. Interesting. And it makes sense. It's just like in a political debate. If uh, you can undercut your opponent's credibility, then nothing they hurl back at you will stick, supposedly, with the voters who are watching. And so um, contempt means don't trust you, don't respect you, find you beneath me. It's an aversive emotion. It's really hard to come back from. I mean, disgust is also an aversive emotion, but it's, um, you know, it can have a real visceral, like bad taste, bad smell. It can be a little bit more of a metaphorical disgust. But to me, contempt is really almost like an attitudinal emotion. Yeah, you know, I've gotten there. Maybe there's an immediate trigger, and it just sets in, and it's not going to go away. But it's probably more likely to fester and grow over time. So it's uh, like the the weeds I was digging out before I got on this call. Right. Call. It's just uh, you have to keep digging and find the tap root, and go deeper and deeper with your shovel, and that's contempt for you. Right. And uh, it's uh, if you're in a pitch meeting, sales situation, uh, yeah. It's, it's if it doesn't work in a marriage, guess what? It doesn't work between you and your client too well right. either. Right. I guess so the, 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 the final question would be, how can you read those facial expressions in an in-person meeting if somebody's wearing a face mask? Uh, well, if they're truly wearing a face mask, um, I think they still have to breathe. <laughs> so at uh, least just possibly they got to cut out around the mouth. Uh, if they don't and they're just breathing through the mask, and it covers the entire face, then I'd say you're out of luck. Yeah. Yeah. It, was, it, it, it hit me this morning. I actually played golf very early with my brother and uh, you know, they, you have to have a face covering on, um, you know, in the, in the parking lot um, and then going up to, you know, get your, you know, make your payment. Once you're on the course, you can take it off if you feel comfortable doing so. But well, uh, yeah, a mask that still lets you see the eyes will yeah. take away about 75% of the signals. Right. Uh, and it over indexes for showing fear and surprise and under indexes for the aversive emotions of disgust and contempt. So it definitely throws you for a loop and you've definitely lost a lot of information. All right. 
Very good. Well, we're just about at the 45 minute mark here, Dan, which is what I try to keep these things to. Um, so I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to, uh, uh, to chat with me. Where can people learn more if they want to learn more uh, about uh, the work you do at uh, Sensory Logic? Well, we do have the obligatory website, which means the three W's and then sensorylogic.com. But I do have a blog uh, called Faces of the Week, and that's at emotionswizard.com. And then the podcast that I've just started is on the New Books Network, and it's called Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight. So if you go to New Books Network, uh, it actually gets about a million downloads a month uh, through the various channels. Um, so I'm a, I'm a newbie, but, uh, you know, that's another way to find out what I'm up to. All right. Very good. And, uh, when I do my write up for this, um, I will include all of those, uh, all of those addresses in there. Um, I can send them to you. Maybe okay, perfect. Yeah. That would be great if you want to send those to me an email and then I will edit this up. Um, I'll do an intro to it and a proper outro, um, just so it, it flows nicely. And, uh, yeah, I'll let you know when, when that's up, probably sometime mid next week. Okay, fair right. enough. Okay. Well, Dan, thank you uh, very much. Are you going to go back to gardening? or uh... I will see what my wife wants. I did promise her that I was her slave for the day if she wanted to uh, keep me in the garden. So um, we'll see whether I get a reprieve or not. All right. Well, uh, best of luck, uh, best of luck uh, to you, and uh, I'll be in touch next week when this is up. Okay. All Good right. luck with uh, your focus groups and all of that. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> oh, I, I doubt it. I think you're probably really good at it. Yeah, it's it's funny. I'm not doing much group work anymore because it's it's pretty impossible to do in an online environment. Um, just yeah. you know, if you've ever been on a group Zoom meeting and people start talking over each other, it um, it's a completely different dynamic than being in a room with with people. So I do a lot of one on ones, and I've been doing a lot of user experience work recently. So which is more one on one anyway. But, yeah, um, no, we we do a lot of one on ones. It's yeah, I've a couple of occasions already for my new podcast. I've interviewed two authors at once. And yeah, just having two people, uh, yeah, creates a lot of talking over each other. Yeah, you almost you really have to call on people, which goes against every fiber of my being. When I run a focus group, I use my body language to get people talking. I can just lean in, and you know, Mary in the corner knows to start talking, but. You know, when it's just this view, people talk over each other and it drives me nuts. Um, so then I have to say, hey, you know, Dan, why don't you take this one first and then we'll go over to you, you know, Jill. Sure. And um, it's just not as natural. But Yeah, no, it changes the dynamics without yeah. question. Yeah. Anyway, I'll let you get back to your day, Dan. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank All right. you. Bye. Thanks, Michael. Well, there you have it. My interview with Dan Hill. If you want to learn more about Dan, you can read his blog, Faces of the Week at emotionswizard.com. And over there, you can also learn more about his new podcast, Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight. Now, if you want to learn more about me, and I hope that you do, uh, and <laughs> investigate my books a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail, please visit mikecarlin.com. That's Carlin with an O and not an I. And from all of us here at Uncorking a Story, this is Mike Carlin saying thanks for listening, and until next time.